The story begins with a man named Bazemo and another man, Aramis, walking to a prison cell in the Bastille, the largest and most well-known prison in all of France. We are told by Bazemo's thoughts that he and Aramis used to be good friends, but since Aramis was promoted to a position above him they are no longer close, Bazemo brings Aramis to a prison cell where the latter is to hear the confession of a prisoner. But the prisoner, a despairing young man, insists that he does not want to give confession. Aramis admits to the young man that the two of them have met before and that he was formerly one of the king's musketeers. The young prisoner admits that he isn't sure what he was in prison for and tells Aramis a story from when he was a boy. He says that while he was growing up he was kept under house arrest and lied about the identity of his parents. He knows that his father is dead but that his mother is still alive. The prisoner asks Aramis if unveiling his presence to the world would unleash a great scandal. Aramis confirms that it would. Aramis then tells him about the rulers of France. King Louis Roman XIII was the king of France until very recently, but he was a weak ruler and allowed himself to be led around by a man named Cardinal Richelieu. The king was married to a woman named Anne of Austria who gave birth to twins. Shortly after that Louis Roman XIII was replaced by Louis Roman XIV. Aramis hands the young prisoner a portrait of the current king and also a mirror requesting that he compare his own face to the portrait. The young man is shocked by the similarities in the comparison. Aramis tells the young man that he wishes to put him on the throne of France for he is the king's son. However, the prisoner refuses. Aramis leaves, kissing the young man's hand as a sign of respect. The next day, Aramis goes to visit his friend and fellow former musketeer Dardagnan in his home. Dardagnan is being fitted for a suit. Aramis tells the tailor fitting him, who is also a tailor for the king, that the king's superintendent of finances Nicholas Fauquet plans to present the king with a portrait of himself on the day of the fate, and he wishes to know what the king will be wearing that day so that they can match the clothes and the portrait to his actual regal dress. He asks for fabric samples from the suits. This conversation makes Dardagnan suspicious. Aramis leaves to go and speak to Fauquet. He tells the man how the portrait idea is faring and requesting for a letter to be given to Monsieur de Lyon asking for the release of a man named Selden from the Bastille. Soon the order comes through and Bazemo releases the prison named Selden, but through the clever switching of orders on the part of Aramis, the young man from the beginning of the story is the one that actually gets released. The young man is named Philippe Marchiali. Aramis offers Philippe the use of his carriage, and as they drive from the prison, Aramis tells him more of the story of who he truly is and why he was imprisoned. Aramis tells Philippe that the current king, his brother, is a poor ruler and proposes that he, as the king's twin, simply exchange places with him. Philippe is hesitant to agree, as he doesn't know if he wants to be king. However, he finally agrees, asking Aramis what he wants in return. Aramis informs him that he wants to be elected pope or ascend to the throne of St. Peter. Philippe agrees to this as well. Back in the city of Vaux, Fauque is seeing to the preparations for the king's arrival. Aramis arrives and views the portrait that is to be presented to the king. He and Fauque agree that it is perfect. The men receive word that the king's men are approaching and Aramis leaves to change his clothes. We learn that his rooms are directly above the king's and that Porthos, one of the other former musketeers, is staying next door to him. The king arrives and a great party is thrown. That evening Dardagnan visits Aramis and attempts to question him regarding his suspicions about Fauquet's intentions in throwing the fate. Dardagnan informs Aramis that he suspects that he is conspiring against the king, but Aramis denies this, swearing on their friendship that he is not. Dardagnan is satisfied and Aramis feels inwardly remorseful about lying to his friend. Dardagnan leaves and this gives Philippe leave to emerge from his hiding place. Aramis tells Philippe that Dardagnan is very loyal to the king, but if he does find out about the switch later on, he will keep his mouth shut because his Gascon pride will keep him from admitting he was deceived. The men then pull up one of the floorboards and look into the chamber below where the king is staying. The king is speaking with Colbert, one of his advisors. He asks Colbert where Fauquet got the money to throw such an expensive and elaborate party. Colbert informs him that Fauquet received 13 million in government money that was never repaid. The king is shocked but decides to wait till the next day to make a decision about Fauquet. The king dismisses Colbert and Philippe starts to put the floorboard back into place before Arami stops him. He instructs Philippe to observe the king's nightly bed rituals very closely. The next day, the king makes plans to arrest Fauquet. However, he plans to do it the next morning. That night, he awakes to find armed and masked men escorting him out of his room. The masked men are Ramis and Porthos. They take him to the Bastille, where Ramis apologizes to Bazemo for the confusion and says that the wrong prisoner was released. They're trying to release Selden. They accidentally released Marchiali. 
He says that he is bringing him back and that he may insist he is the king of France since that was his first move after escaping. The king is locked up in the cell that formerly belonged to his brother. Back in Vaux, Philippe begins to settle into life as a king. Nearby, Aramis confesses his crime to Fauquet, and the other man is horrified that such a subterfuge happened under his roof. Fauquet instructs Aramis to get out of the country and tells him that he may take Porthos and go to his fortress, Belle Isle. Fauquet goes immediately to the Bastille to free the king, and after some resistance from the unsuspecting Basemo, he is taken into the king's cell. The king is so unnerved and desperate that he assumes Fauquet is there to kill him. Fauquet tells him that he is there to free him and then tells the king all about the plot against him and the installation of his twin brother on his throne. The king is in disbelief that he has a brother he was unaware of. He states that he intends to execute Aramis, Porthos, and his brother. Fauquet tries to dissuade him, reminding him that they cannot execute someone of royal blood. He asks the king to pardon Aramis and Porthos, but the king refuses. They leave the prison together, leaving behind a very confused Basimo. Back in Vox, Philippe is concerned when he does not hear from Ramis, but he keeps up appearances, pretending to be the king throughout the day. He finally meets his mother, Anne of Austria. His mother attempts to get him to arrest Fauquet, but Philippe resists. Soon the real king, Louis, comes back. Everyone in the room is shocked, save Anne, who is horrified to see her two sons together like this. Louis tells Dardagnan to arrest Philippe. As he is being arrested, Philippe attempts to shame his mother and brother for what they have done to him. Colbert orders Dardagnan to cover Philippe's head with an iron mask and bring him to state, Marguerite, the island prison. Before leaving, Dardagnan admits to Fauquet that Philippe would have made an equal or perhaps even better king than Louis. Across the country, Aramis and Porthos desperately escape from Vaux, riding all day and night to get out of town. They change horses at every opportunity until eventually they reach a way station with no fresh horses. Aramis despairs until he remembers that the last former musketeer, Athos, lives nearby. Athos lives peacefully with his son, Rael. Aramis and Porthos show up at his doorstep and ask to speak to him. Aramis tells Athos of the plot to overthrow the king. Aramis then says that he may be able to salvage the plot through his allies in Spain. He asks Athos if he would like to come along, and when the other man says no, Aramis and Porthos leave on their own, Athos tells his son that he thinks it will be the last time he will ever see them. Athos and Rael decide to track down Dardagnan and Steep. Marguerite. As they approach the garrison, the two men hear someone yelling, and a silver dinner plate is thrown out of a window to their feet. A message is etched into the plate that turns out to be from Philippe. Before they can react, someone starts firing at them. Dardagnan appears and orders the shooters to halt. He quickly proceeds to explain to Athos and Rael that they must pretend to be Spanish because the governor of the castle will kill them if he believes that they were capable of reading the inscription carved into the plate. Dardagnan erases the inscription on the plate and tells the governor that the two men are Spanish naval captains. When they have a private moment, Athos tells Dardagnan that he knows about the plot to overthrow the king. Dardagnan is upset by this, worrying about his friend's safety. As they walk around the fort, Athos gets his first glimpse of the prisoner. Wearing a mask of iron, the prisoner yells and screams, insisting that he be called accursed. Soon, Dardagnan receives a letter from the king ordering him to go back to Paris. He, Athos, and Rael leave the island together. But Athos and Rael must return to their own lives. Dardagnan hugs them as he bids them goodbye. Dardagnan's first order upon getting back to Paris is to collect the money that Fauquet owes the government. After he does this, Fauquet finds himself nearly bankrupt. Days later, Dardagnan is instructed to arrest Fauquet as well, but before he can, Fauquet escapes on a white horse. Dardagnan pursues him, pulling a pistol on him and ordering him to stop. Fauquet tells Dardagnan to shoot him, but the other man refuses. The pace of the pursuit soon becomes too much for Dardagnan's horse, which stumbles and collapses. Dardagnan then begins to chase Fauquet on foot, managing to grab hold of the man's leg even as he himself is injured from the fall off his horse. Dardagnan, however, soon faints. He awakes to find Fauquet standing over him and is grateful for the man's honor in not killing him while he was unconscious. The two men have to walk back to town. Fauquet has been arrested. He gives the message sent the man for Dardagnan to relay to either a Madame Bellier or a man named Pellison. Meanwhile, the king discovers where Ramis and Porthos are hiding and tells Dardagnan to bring twenty of his best men to Belle Isle. Dardagnan realizes that he must find a way to mitigate this peacefully without harming two of his best friends. On Belle Isle, Aramis and Porthos are talking when they suddenly see a fleet of ships on the horizon. Around nightfall, a small boat docks on the island, and a man emerges. 
He hands Aramis a letter from Dardagnan, which basically states that the king ordered him to take the island and capture them. Dardagnan requests that the two men come out to meet him. But Aramis tells the man delivering the letter to ask that Dardagnan come out to the island instead. Dardagnan obliges with the company of a naval officer who has been ordered by the king to follow him. Dardagnan tells the officer that he wishes to speak with his friends privately, and when the officer objects, Dardagnan draws his sword on him. The officer relents and backs away. The three friends embrace and start trying to figure out how to get out of the problem they are in. Aramis wonders if they should stay and fight off the soldiers. He then suggests that Dardagnan take Porthos back to the king and swear that he had nothing to do with the plot. This gives Dardagnan an idea which he whispers to Aramis. Aramis approves of the plan and Dardagnan heads back to his ship. However, when he gets back and requests that Aramis and Porthos be allowed to come onto the ship to deliberate freely, he is handed an order from the king preventing it. Dardagnan pretends to accept the order but is inwardly furious. He tells the fleet that he intends to resign and that they must return to France. He thinks that this will raise the blockade around the island and give his friends time to escape. His men inform him that if he refuses the order and attempts to resign that they have been ordered to arrest him. Dardagnan allows himself to be arrested and the blockade returns to France. Back on the island, Aramis tells Porthos of Dardagnan's plan which he doesn't realize has already failed. He then says that if there is only time for one of them to escape it should be Porthos. Porthos refuses, saying they either escape together or not at all. Porthos then tells Aramis that he has felt weak lately and that he feels that he will die soon. Suddenly another fleet arrives. Porthos and Aramis fight and seize a prisoner whom they begin to question. It turns out that the prisoner is the son of man named Biscarat, who was one of the swordsmen that attacked and fought the musketeers on the day they met Dardagnan. Aramis and Porthos are pleased to meet the man and begin to consider him a friend. However, more shots ring through the night and Aramis realizes that there is a second wave of soldiers coming. Aramis releases Biscarat and he and Porthos head for Lakmeria in a final bid for escape. When they reach the grotto of Lakmeria, Porthos' legs go weak. They manage to get into a canoe that Aramis prepared for their escape, but are soon followed into the grotto by the soldiers. Aramis and Porthos manage to ambush the soldiers and win the fight. More soldiers are sent and then all are shocked to find that only two men are defending themselves and evading capture so well. A third wave is sent and then Aramis instructs Porthos to use a barrel of gunpowder as a bomb to kill them so that the two men can escape in the confusion of the blast. Aramis pulls the boat around while Porthos is to light the fuse on the barrel. He does so, but in the last moment his legs fail him again and he gets caught in the blast. Aramis attempts to come to his aid, but is too late. Porthos dies, being crushed by a huge granite rock set free in an explosion. Aramis becomes so distraught that he can barely stand. Three servants help him into his boat and begin to row into Spain. But before they get there, the boat is captured and surrenders. The sailors on board the ship intend to spare the servants' lives, but execute Aramis. However, Aramis shows them proof that he is a former musketeer and general of the Jesuits and the captain of the ship begins to follow his orders. Aramis, still grieving, spends the night staring into space and resting his head against a rail on the ship. Back in France, Dardagnan attempts to speak to the king but is turned away. He is stripped of his title but not arrested and finds himself relieved by this. He intends to head back to Belle Isle to help his friends but before he can leave the king requests to speak to him. When he enters the king's chambers, he is asked what his orders were regarding Belle Isle and why he did not see them out. Dardagnan protests, pointing out that he clearly was not told about all of the orders. The king says that he only gave all of the orders to those he saw as faithful. This offends Dardagnan, who has always seen himself as faithful to the king. The king says that he failed to fight the king's enemies and Dardagnan argues that this time the king's enemies were his own two best friends. The king tells him that he failed his test of loyalty. A messenger enters and tells the king that he has lost 110 soldiers at Belle Isle. Dardagnan is secretly pleased that his friends seem to have gotten away. Dardagnan finally relents and agrees to serve the king again if he will pardon Aramis and Porthos. The king agrees and Dardagnan returns to Belle Isle. He is unable to find Aramis but discovers that Porthos has been killed. He returns to the king and tells him of this only to find that the king already knew. Dardagnan demands to know why he wasn't told and the king confesses to reading a letter that Aramis sent to him. He gives Dardagnan permission to bury Porthos. At the funeral, Dardagnan finds that Porthos has willed him to have whatever he wishes from his house and that Aramis should have a pension from his money, also that Rael should have his manservant Mauston. 
Back on his own estate, Athos hears of Porthos' death and faints from shock and weakness. Soon, he also finds that his son Rael has died while fighting in Africa. Athos dies from the shock of two important people in his life passing on so close together. D'Artagnan visits soon after, finding his friend dead and collapsing into grief. When he collects himself, D'Artagnan realizes that he is at least happy that Athos and his son are together in heaven. He stays on at Athos' estate to see to his funeral arrangements, but internally wonders if he will be next to die. He bids a last farewell to his departed friend and leaves once again for Paris. The epilogue of the book begins four years later. D'Artagnan is now a count. Fauque is in prison. The king is throwing a hunting party on what used to be Athos' land. D'Artagnan is seen to the party when he is told the duck Dalmeta, or rather his old friend Aramis, is there. The two men hug and go off to have a private conversation. The remaining two musketeers pay their respects at Athos and Rael's tomb. The king has agreed to form an alliance with England so that he may start a war with Holland. D'Artagnan reveals that he will be leading the charge into Holland, but that he expects to receive a marshal's baton for his deeds. We are then taken to Holland, where the English and the French are sailing into the country. Aramis has assured them of the Spain's neutrality in the fight. D'Artagnan commands an army that takes many fortresses. The king is pleased to hear of his success and sends a messenger to Holland to make D'Artagnan a marshal. The messenger arrives with a small, heavy chest and D'Artagnan opens it regardless of the fact that he is in the middle of an attack. He is just turning to open it when he is struck in the chest by a cannonball. His last words are Athos Porthos, farewell till we meet again. Ramis said you forever. As the novel closes out, the narrator points out that only one musketeer now remains a four.